Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Amid the mayhem of religious fanaticism and the rise of a perilous intolerance, there is but one book you should read to avert a 2017 winter of discontent. It is Ambassador Omar Gobash's Picador volume, Letters to a Young Muslim. Gobash is Ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to Russia, a diplomat, scholar, an advocate of literacy, an entrepreneur, and outdoorsman. Excerpted in Foreign Affairs magazine, Letters to a Young Muslim is a collection penned from the ambassador to his son on the meaning of being Muslim in contemporary society. The book was among Time magazine's most anticipated of 2017, and deservedly so. A reinterpretation of Islam that is as bravely soothing as it is forward-thinking. The book is an ode to peace, a meditation on soulfulness, and yet a call to mindful action. In these elegant short essays, Gobash grapples with the intersection of his faith, familial identity, and the question of global citizenship that binds us to collective self-preservation. He's here with me to expound on his most virtuous volume. Ambassador, you can see I was quite taken with your book. Thank you very much. It's, it's an it's honor to have you here. Thank you. What do you most want to impart of all the lessons here, mm -hmm. familial and religious, in terms of this reconciliation of faith and civilization today, what was the most important thing you wanted to tell your son? <clears throat> well, I think uh, what I really wanted to get across to him was to, uh, to have confidence in himself, uh, and, and really not just himself, for, for people of his age, to have confidence in their own selves. Uh, to trust their instincts, to trust their good nature, um, and, and to maybe be a little skeptical about, uh, you know, what uh, older people, adults, uh, tell them uh, what to do. Uh, and I wanted for him to have the confidence to maintain a sense of identity, a sense of personality, uh, and to have the ability to step back uh, from uh, the demands of society or, or, uh, or, or uh, religious authorities mm -hmm. and to ask himself whether it really all made sense. Um, the other side of that is to have the confidence to uh, uh, deconstruct, to, to uh, take apart uh, a set of beliefs and to put them back together uh, with the confidence that um, uh, uh, he would be able to do that successfully. So I, I really wanted him to be able to uh, uh, em em embark upon you know, adulthood with a sense of, of confidence and um, uh, a courage, really. What do you think is key to salvaging the courage in this day and age? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's very disappointing in some ways um, uh, to be a Muslim these days. Um, it, it, you, look into, you look at the media, you see all of these terrible things happening across the, uh, the Arab world in particular, um, but more broadly across the Muslim world. Um, and, and then you have the reaction in the West and, and in, in places like Russia and China, uh, the rise of Islamophobia. And you begin to wonder, well, you know, why do people uh, not like Muslims? Why are we being targeted in this way? Um, and then there is the other side of it, which, uh, which is that, you know, you begin to think, well, uh, what is wrong with us? How is it possible that we have so many acts of violence uh, declared in the name of, of Islam? 
Um, and how do you react to that? Uh, that's that's a, a very, very tough question that I think uh, we've, I've personally dealt with for the last few years. Um, of course, we would like to be able to say, look, these acts of violence are committed by people who don't understand the religion, who have hijacked the religion, who, uh, who use the name Islam in, in, uh, but, but have no legitimacy whatsoever. But then once you begin to delve into some of the theological sources that they look at, uh, it doesn't, it's not so clear anymore. Uh, and my position would be that we need to take responsibility for the entire range of actions that are declared in the name of Islam in order to then be able to pull back to a, a kind of a theological uh, basis that says, actually, you cannot do that. These actions that you've committed are completely out of touch with basic humanity, which is what underlies uh, the religion of Islam. And if that is the case, then, you know, uh, you, you, you really don't have anything to, to add to Islam. There were moments in your life that were particularly formative in shaping an outlook that is more pacifistic in nature than militant. 9-11, uh, you reflect on that here and in other literature that you've written and the impact that had, of course, your family, your father. Can you tell our viewers how this became a personal story so they're familiar sure. with your livelihood and how you came to write these letters? Sure. Um, my father um, had a very tough uh, upbringing, tough uh, childhood, um, and essentially a, a very poor one. Uh, but that was, you know, sort of the same for everybody in our region in the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, the region being the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and uh, he managed to uh, scrape together an education uh, and uh, he became very well educated in comparison with the rest of uh, his generation. He was appointed Minister of State for Foreign Affairs uh, in the early 70s uh, for, at the beginning of the foundation of the United Arab Emirates. Um, and in 1977, uh, as is uh, common uh, with uh, diplomacy and, and uh, foreign sort of political visits, uh, there is somebody who always escorts or greets uh, visitors to the country. Uh, and my father was escorting the Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Syria. Uh, and uh, the Syrian foreign minister was the target uh, of this assassination. Unfortunately, my father was killed. Uh, and, and now, you know, almost 40 years later, I find that I'm still working with the, uh, the consequences of that, that event. Um, so I, I take that, that idea of, of a violence committed, and in, in the case of my father, even more tragically, it's accidental uh, uh, violence. And I um, think about how violence affects so many lives in the Arab world in particular, but also in the Muslim world. And that violence can be you know, politically inspired violence, it can be violence with weaponry, or you know, on a more sort of mundane level, it is the violence, the domestic violence, it's the violence of, of um, you know, the psychological violence that we do to each other. So that, that's really the kind of broader field that I'm looking at. Where are we using violence as a means of expressing ourselves? And how is it that we can perhaps um, f think of different ways in which we might be able to express ourselves? I think the violence that we see in the political sphere in, in the Arab world um, is, is an indication of the, the, the generalized violence that we see in our lives. And the reality today, in response to contemporary acts of terrorism is that there are some coordinated attacks, but there are a lot of lone wolves. The, that seems to be the predominant strain of that virulent form of extremism. You tout a message, not in God's name, which was the title of another author we had here, mm -hmm. Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. How do you ultimately remove that impulse? One of the um, potential areas in which we could start working on this is by um, uh, changing the relationship between our religious leaders, our clerics, our scholars of Islam, uh, and the people that they address. Uh, the, the relationship has tra traditionally been framed in the following way, that the scholars of Islam have a particular um, uh, authority and a right to interpret and to make judgments. Uh, and their attitude to those who don't have that same level of scholarship is that, you know, you are, um, uh, you, you are the masses, you don't understand, you have an inability to really uh, comprehend uh, the, the true meaning of, of Islam. And so essentially it's a, it's a kind of an authoritarian relationship uh, and they give instruction. 
Uh, and for the most part, I think, you know, uh, people, people go along with that idea. And so I've seen sort of very, very well-educated and intelligent, cultivated people uh, turning to uh, um, a so-called scholar of Islam to ask him their uh, opinion uh, of what they should do. Uh, and it's, it, that in itself uh, needs to change, I think. And I think many of the scholars will actually agree with this as well. It, it is one thing to be um, a, a literate scholar of Islam in the 7th century or the 10th century or the 13th century uh, where you know, illiteracy was widespread and you know, people were living hand to mouth. Today, the nature of knowledge has, has changed radically. Uh, we understand that you know, religious knowledge is, is one area uh, and although some, some scholars uh, insist that religious knowledge actually encompasses all kinds of knowledge, uh, we, we can see sort of from, from recent sort of scandals and events that uh, religious knowledge has a certain way of dealing with the world, but then there is psychological knowledge, there's uh, economic knowledge, there's knowledge of politics. There, the, there are a whole set of ways in which we can complement um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the language and the methods of analysis that the religious scholars use. So what I'm suggesting is that the religious scholar needs to widen, uh, and the, they are male, so they need to widen their scope of, of uh, uh, or their understanding of, of knowledge. Um, and once we get to that position, then we can see that we don't need necessarily to use violence. Violence is a very basic tool to achieve a, a, a certain end. Uh, and in fact, you know, if, if you don't have uh, an advanced uh, culture uh, and educational system where you're actually producing a fantastic technology, then your violence is going to be very, very basic. Yeah. Um, would you say the... Per the would you say, Ambassador, that the preponderance of violence, the majority of violence, is inspired politically, and that class of zealots is, in in some ways, seeking to define the Muslim or Islamic creed through theological evidence that they're that they're making an argument based on their own literary reading, or would you say that? dating back to centuries ago, that the problem of illiteracy is still a grave one? Well, the problem of literacy uh, and illiteracy is, is actually a very grave one in the uh, Muslim world. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've been given information that 70% of the Muslim world is illiterate. Um, you know, what are the long-term consequences of that level of illiteracy? How do these people acquire knowledge? How do they get uh, their information? And uh, uh, who structures that information for them? Um, so so that, that's uh, kind of one set of problems. Uh, the other set of problems, I think, is related to the idea that um, to be a good Muslim uh, is to make sacrifices, uh, and not to think of yourself, but to think of the glory of Islam and the community. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, a couple of days ago, I came across a, a comment uh, on one of my um, positions where I put forward the idea of um, re reviving and, um, and regenerating our uh, Islamic culture through focusing on uh, indivi the individual and individual responsibility. Uh, and this was pointed out, you know, uh, as being as un unnecessary and uh, Western concept. So this negation of the self um, uh, that, that is being promoted by a lot of people, I find the negation of the self uh, as a kind of a, a manipulative uh, technique to acquire power over other people. Uh, so that's another kind of element that I really, um, I don't want to scare young people, but I, they must understand that manipulation is part of, of the game. Manipulation is more dangerous in the hands of an uninformed 70%. But in terms of rectifying that yeah. basic problem of illiteracy, do you think it's necessary for the Sunni and Shia sects to embrace more fully reconciliation? That is a great question, and um, that is actually a great point. Um, uh, I would actually say that it's vital um, that the two great branches of Islam come together at a, a, at a, a very high level uh, to really sort of just pose the question, if both sides wanted to settle the issue of what happened at the Prophet's death, how would that resolution look? What would it look like? Uh, and, and, if, and if there is no resolution, then what is the future for the Muslim world? And so, you know, it, it would be great if we could organize, um, if we could get the idea out that, that Sunni Islam and Shia Islam are two uh, great branches of Islam, uh, and they're almost kind of um, mirror images of each other. 
um, representing sort of different, different, uh, uh, gosh. I think that that would be a fabulous idea if we could do that. Speaking as a scholar of the book, but also as an ambassador, what is the most significant geopolitical obstacle to achieving that? You know, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's uh, an, an obstacle. I mean, you know, you have the two uh, countries that represent Shia and Sunni Islam. You have Saudi Arabia representing Sunni Islam, which is very close uh, uh, geographically to um, uh, Shia Islam uh, in Iran. Uh, and actually, maybe that, that geopolitical proximity um, it, it may be the reason why we could actually uh, push to some kind of resolution. I mean, the, the, the rising levels of tension between uh, Saudi Arabia and more broadly the Gulf states on the one hand, uh, and Iran, uh, on, on the other hand, um, is, is reaching sort of critical levels. Uh, and how do you diffuse that? Um, you, can, you can think that it is purely a political thing or an economic uh, issue, but if you uh, go to the heart of it, um, you, you might be able to see that it is actually a, a Sunnah Shia um, issue. Um, and, you know, perhaps one day we will see uh, somebody coming forward and, and, and organizing some kind of at least the first steps of a reconciliation. That would diffuse tension right across the region. That would be a remarkable thing. In your negotiations, in listening to the youth of Russia, the youth of your native country, the youth of Qatar, and surrounding the surrounding region, what most resonates with you that this next wave of, we call them here millennials, but yes. it's a, an international term. What are young people demanding in terms of geopolitical reconciliation, not just between Sunni and Shia, but in terms of the ongoing escalation and de-escalation in Syria and the connected problems that the U.S. and Russia hmm are going to have to tackle alongside partners in the Arab world. My understanding of, of the way young people are looking at the world uh, from the region is that their minds are still unformed about um, how things should be. Uh, I think that that's one of the great things, uh, and it's one of the great opportunities that we have. Their minds are not set in stone. Um, they haven't become uh, uh, it, attached to very strict ideas of the way the world should be. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're really the internet generation, uh, and so they're exposed uh, to so many ideas um, that you actually, c you, you, f you no longer know whether these ideas are sort of regional, local, uh, um, you know, so historically associated with our region, or whether they are, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, um, ideas from very far away. Um, and that, that becomes very interesting because it pushes against the traditional ideas of uh, Muslim identity, that there is an ability that we can reject the outside, reject the foreign, uh, and, and stay uh, true to our, our own um, uh, concepts and, uh, and historical kind of uh, intellectual tradition. Um, and so because of this um, exposure to ideas across the internet, uh, I see that you know, our identity and our personal understanding of ourselves has actually changed radically. Uh, and so we are already hybrid, and that there is no turning back from that hybrid nature that we have become. Um, and so this is, this is like, as a starting point, um, I am very hopeful and very optimistic about youth in the region. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it, we saw that in the Arab Spring, 2011-2012, uh, that there was this great um, uh, rush of, of, of uh, youthful energy. Uh, and, and the worry was that I think that ultimately they weren't confident enough in their own uh, perspectives. Uh, and they essentially handed over power back to the people that had, they had, that had just given it up to them. Right. And, and it is rooted in the Quran, this idea of carpe diem. Uh, destiny of man is determined by man, woman, child, not some higher power. And I think that the Abrahamic faiths have the tendency to dispel a notion of camaraderie when, in fact, there is some real consensus. Yeah, sure. And you tell your son and stress that the warrior is one of the, the sadder figures in our modern Muslim society, which I think is such a critical point especially given the rise of the totalitarian. The warrior is different from the strong man. The, the, the warrior is, is, is again, I feel, a, a kind of a, a lone wolf. 
uh, without a, a sort of a backup team, without an organization, without an institution to, to, to base themselves on. Uh, so I, when I say warrior, I'm not saying a soldier. Right. So these are two very, very different ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, this, the rise of strong men uh, seems to be taking place across the globe uh, in, in democracies and, and in more authoritarian states. So perhaps there's just a, a kind of a, an innate desire um, that has surfaced uh, to, uh, to, to have a sense of order, uh, to have somebody else make the decisions for you. Um, there you, you suggest a, a redefinition of the warrior uh, as someone who embraces life in its complexity and fights for the social and economic justice. Yes, because I, I actually think that those are much more uh, challenging um, ob objectives. I, I, you know, when I, I think of suicide bombers and the way that they talk about, you know, prior to, to going and committing their terrible acts, uh, they, they give the impression that they think they're making the biggest sacrifice. And I, I've said this a couple of times to, to my friends, you know, it, it, giving up your life may be the biggest sacrifice, but it's certainly not the most difficult thing to sacrifice. Uh, you know, uh, to, to spend the next 30 or 40 years um, helping, uh, educating people or, or teaching uh, young Muslims how to read and write, that is a much greater sacrifice and a much more interesting sacrifice than to go and blow yourself up in a marketplace. It's just nonsensical. And I think we need to, we need to hear even the radicals uh, uh, answer the question of why uh, that kind of uh, contribution is, is greater than uh, you know, the contributions of, of, uh, to, to our economy and to our society. And in the same way you imagine a new, as you were alluding to yourself, a new definition of personal responsibility. And it is an entirely progressive vision of equality, understanding, and tolerance, given your own pedigree uh, of yes. Arab and Russian roots. Yes. How can you take that founding document, in essence, um, of a Quran um, and bring to the Arab world a sense of ownership, not just of the document, but of human rights that it can enshrine for this generation? It's an interesting, interesting question. And, and, you know, in my book, what I try to do is I try to talk about the responsibilities of the Muslim individual. Uh, and again, you know, people have complained about this idea and said, you know, it's the, it's the group is more important than the individual. The individual is a foreign concept. Uh, and, you know, my response to that would be, well, when I stand in front of the mirror, I see an individual, I don't see a community. Uh, even though I do have, I recognize the, the, the responsibilities that I have towards the community and I, I recognize the, the beauty of the community. But to have a community that is based on um, uh, destroyed individuals, it means that you have an impo impoverished community. Um, so I, I, I think that, that's a very, very important thing to, to be clear about. Personal responsibility is also very difficult if you're living in patriarchal societies uh, where, you know, the, the, the father is the boss, where the, 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 the big, um, uh, the, the, the tough guy, the, uh, uh, the leader is, is the boss. He takes all the responsibility. He takes all the decisions. And most people will then fall in line and say, well, okay, you know, it wasn't in my hands, so I did what I was told. And so, you know, you're going to have to change the way in which you begin to delegate authority, for example. And once you begin to delegate authority, uh, whether it's in, in government or, or in, in economics, uh, or even in the family, then you might begin to see more of an expression of personal uh, responsibility. And, and how do you use the, what we would call here the constitutional, the textual tradition yeah. to infuse that shared authority? How, how do you take the origin of faith, of, of the I, Islamic faith, and blend it into a tradition that is a shared authority? Well, I would say that, I mean, first of all, it's, it's going to be a function of our changing kind of social uh, world. Um, we aren't living in desert villages anymore. We, are, we uh, live in countries where we have three generations. Uh, the older generation that grew up in the desert and maybe illiterate to uh, their grandchildren who are completely you know, uh, connected globally uh, and who speak uh, a number of different languages. Uh, and so the, these, this, the fact of these uh, generational changes uh, means that the, the conversation must take place. Uh, and many young people are 
uh, already challenging uh, authority. But, you know, to challenge authority is not to uh, disrespect uh, authority. It is to ask for a, a different kind of uh, relationship. And I think that can also be done uh, quite uh, in accordance both with our traditions and with, uh, with the, um, you know, the, the, the values of the Qur'an. Uh, but most importantly, I think that if we want to be uh, ethical, um, it's very difficult um, for us to be ethical if we are always thinking about the community. Um, and this is another issue that's very important. When we focus too much on the community and the protection uh, in, almost in a kind of a gang-like manner of all members of the community wherever they are around the world, uh, then, we've, then we face a problem of politicizing our ethics. Um, uh, how do I know that the, the group that uh, is um, you know, being uh, uh, persecuted is really deserving of my uh, energy, time, money, and protection? Uh, perhaps they aren't deserving. Yeah? And so I prefer that we get away from this idea of uh, communal protection uh, and begin to think more of you know, the, um, the, the moral worthiness of particular actions and whether I can support a fellow Muslim in a particular case uh, as opposed to you know, whatever crime he commits. Because he's a Muslim, I'm going to protect him. Are they assigning this book? Letters to a Young Muslim in Your Son's Classroom in <laughs> the UAE? Uh, it's uh, early days. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I just would wonder, Ambassador, if you think that the schools in the UAE and Qatar and maybe even now in Iran and, and Saudi Arabia would be responsive to this message. Well, you know, I think that I, I know for a fact that uh, there are many people who are responsive to the message. Uh, they may not agree with everything, but this was never meant to be a, a kind of a, a set of doctrines. Um, this is a, a, an appeal to uh, discussion, to debate, uh, to doubt, to, uh, to patience with each other. Uh, and very importantly, I, in my own personal life, I don't like to offend people unnecessarily. Um, and so here, you know, the clerics can be denounced easily, but I don't want to do that at all because I believe that the clerics perform a, fun, a fundamental role, uh, a vital function within our own societies. And actually, uh, they have so much to give. Perhaps the problem is simply that they aren't aware of what they need to give because they don't know us as well as they should. Um, perhaps they don't understand that the flock that they have been taking care of has actually evolved and become much, much better educated and much more able to engage with them on these more uh, delicate questions. So that, that's what I'm trying to do. Well, I think you do it magnificently and you're opening up a really critical dialogue that I'm sure you'll take on the road here in the U.S. and of course abroad ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on the program today. Thank you very much. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation. With special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.